Welcome to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. This teaching is from the series Mission Possible. As Christians, we are called to be on mission, longing and working to see God known and worshipped by people from every culture, from our own city to the ends of the earth. Today I'm going to have two texts that we're going to be looking at. The first one is in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And the second one is from the book of Galatians, uh, chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, where we're going to see Paul references and explains uh, Genesis 12, 1 to 3. So pretty much after I've read Paul's words, you could probably leave because he's going to tell you what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, he's going to explain Genesis 12 for us. So Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, and then Galatians 3, 8 and 9. You can follow along up on the screens. All the verses will be there. Hear now the word of our sovereign God, our creator, and our redeemer, and our Lord. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And then in the New Testament, in the book of Galatians, writing by the Spirit, the Apostle Paul says, the Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. There was a young man named Scott Harrison who had been uh, raised here in America, and when he was off in college in the New York area, on the side to, to make a little money, he started promoting clubs, nightclubs in college. And it turned out that he was very, very good at this particular thing. And by the time he had graduated from college, he was one of the best promoters of the club scene in all of New York City. He was throwing lavish, expensive parties for MTV, VH1, Bacardi, and the, the magazine Elle. Uh, and as you can imagine, along with that clubbing uh, promotion, he slid into a particular lifestyle that seemed to go along with it. And that lifestyle, sad to say, oftentimes included, and it did for him, uh, a lot of drugs. But he was making a lot of money. So he went off on vacation uh, to Uruguay, and in the midst of that vacation, he began to have a crisis of conscience. He had been raised uh, in a Christian home, but was kind of far from it by this point. And he began to struggle when he was in Uruguay, saying, I'm making a lot of money, I'm hanging out with the beautiful people and all these things, but my life is pointless. There's nothing that I'm actually doing. And so he came back and he started doing research. He eventually stopped what he was doing, joined, I believe it was Operation Mobilization uh, with the Mercy Ships, started going around overseas, and he came back, he stopped his job, and he began a charity that is known as Charity Water to try and get water in all of these villages. You remember last week as I was talking about our compassion for the lost and suffering, we saw that there are billions of people who don't live even within a half of a mile of a source of water. Many people get many diseases from their water. So he began devoting his life to getting clean sources of water and digging water, particularly in uh, Africa. Now, this was a huge shift for this young man. His life looks completely different now than it did 10 or 15 years ago. Everything has changed. But there's a question for you and me. It's good to hear those kind of stories. But when we approach the topic of missions and God's heart for the nations, sometimes Christians act like God changed that way. And we kind of go through the Old Testament and we think, well, God was interested in Israel. But everybody else was just kind of out there on the side. And then, and then when Jesus comes, suddenly God kind of has a change of heart. He's kind of like Scott Hamilton. He, he kind of is uh, Harrison, Scott Harrison, and he, he's figuring out that, you know, well, maybe there's this whole world out there. And that's sometimes how Christians present missions. It kind of begins with the Great Commission. And prior to that, 
the Gentiles aren't really in the picture. Well, is that true? Is that actually the way it is? Or, in fact, has God always been on mission for the nations? And, in fact, has the church and the people of God always had a call to be on mission for the nations? Well, we're going to look in the Scripture. So let's begin with God's call to Abram, which is right at the beginning. If you look in the book of Genesis, the first 11 chapters are basically a prologue. They're kind of just getting you to where the story is really, really going to kick off that we're going to cover in the Old Testament. And this is the call of Abraham. And Abram is there, and he's in Ur of the Chaldees, and God comes to Abram, and he makes these great covenantal promises to Abram. And there's basically three of them that I've got highlighted here in some different colors on the screen. Notice we read God says, leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the land I'm going to show you. And the basis for you doing this, Abram, is my great covenant. And here it is. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I'm going to make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. There's basically three great promises here that God makes to Abram. I've taught on these before, so I'm not going to belabor this very long this morning. But first, he uh, I've got highlighted in yellow, is a promise for posterity. I'm going to increase your numbers, Abram. It's not going to be just about you. Abram, I'm going to turn you into a whole nation. In fact, a nation of nations are going to come from you. Abram, it will not remain just you. I'm going to increase you. Secondly, he gives Abram a promise for provision. I've got that highlighted in green. It's summarized in the word, I will bless you. Abram, I know you're being called to pick up and leave everything you've ever known. You're going to leave everything behind, all your family behind. You're going to go out into what appears to be a hostile world. How are you going to make it? Well, here's how you're going to make it, Abram. I will bless you. Whatever you're leaving, I will give you far more. I, in fact, will be your blessing. And then thirdly, in verse 3, which I've got highlighted kind of in orange, he gives this promise of protection. I'm going to bless whoever blesses you. And if anybody curses you, Abram, if anybody makes themselves your enemy, they've actually made themselves my enemy, Abram. You don't even have to worry about it. I will care for you. So think about this. If God appeared to you today and said, I'm going to bless you so that you will increase. You will have posterity. I'm going to bless you so that you will have provision of anything you will need. And I'm going to bless you so that you will have protection. I myself will be your front and rear guard. I mean, it's not like at that point I could say, yeah, but God, what I would really like is. He's covered everything I could possibly need in life. And this is God's covenant to Abram. And we have no record that Abram was doing anything to earn or desire this. Now, these are great promises. But what I want you to see from this point is the purpose for the covenantal promises and blessings. Because God doesn't just give these promises. He also tells Abram, here's the purpose. Here's why I'm giving these things to you. And it's basically given in two phrases. Notice, I'll make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I'll make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I'm going to bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Abraham is blessed, so he can be a blessing. He's not blessed so he can just lavish it on himself. He's not even blessed so that other people will see how blessed it is to walk with God and it'll make them want it. That's not why he's blessed. He's blessed so he can pass the blessing on to others. Secondly, notice it's not just for him and his family. It's not that I'm blessing you so you and your family can be blessed. No, Abram, I'm blessing you, and it spills over into your family, and here's why. Because all peoples on earth are to be blessed through you. Not just your family, not just those who are close to you, every people on earth. And the word actually means even clans. It's down to a small group. Abram, there are all of these clans out there. There are all of these groups that you don't even know about, but I'm going to reach into every nook and cranny of humanity, every people group on this earth, and I'm going to get blessing to them. And to do that, I'm going to channel it through you. That's why you're blessed, Abram, 
not for you, not for your family, not to consume it on yourself, but because I want to bless others. So Abraham is God's pipeline to bless other people. And Abraham must not hoard the blessings. They're not given to him to keep himself. He is simply the channel through whom the blessings are to go to everyone else. Now, this is where we're going to move to the next text, because the ultimate blessing that Abraham is given is the gospel. We oftentimes think when we think of the blessing of God, the way it is taught very often in the modern American church is how I can get blessing for myself. The Scripture doesn't know anything about that. I'm blessed, not because I try and get it, but because God just graciously gives it to me, but he gives it so that I can pass it on to others. The second thing is we immediately, when we think of blessings in the American church, you could go look at a Christian bookstore. All the books are, it's all about material blessings. But Paul tells us that is not the real heart of the blessing. Abraham here is blessed with the gospel. If you notice, the blessing is given to Abraham by grace and not by works. What has Abraham done for God at this point when God comes and gives him these covenant promises? Nothing. He's a pagan living among pagans. That's what he's done. He hasn't even gotten up and left his homeland yet. It comes by grace, not by works. Abraham has done nothing to earn God's favor. His obedience of getting up and leaving actually flows from the covenantal promises. It is always, always, always grace comes before obedience. Faith comes before works. Gospel comes before we walk in obedience to the law. It is always that pattern. And so God gives Abraham great covenantal promises, and Abraham's obedience flows from that. So we know it's the gospel. But Paul specifically tells us this and points it out in Galatians 3, 8, and 9. Notice in our text, he says, The Scripture, speaking of Genesis 12, foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Paul says, when you're reading Genesis 12, here's how you should read it. This is about God's heart to bless the nations, to bless the Gentiles, to get the gospel to them. God would bless the Gentiles, the nations, by faith. And he says this is the gospel being announced ahead of time to Abraham. And he specifically quotes Genesis chapter 12. All nations will be blessed. So, friends, I want to remind us again because a big part of what I'm doing up here every week is teaching us how to read the Bible. If when I read Genesis 12 a few minutes ago, this is not what you got out of it, then we still have more homework to do. We have to learn to read the Bible correctly. If what I get out of Genesis 12, which is what a lot of preachers seem to get out of Genesis 12, is if you learn to walk like Abraham did and you make covenant with God, you can get all kinds of stuff you've completely missed what the text is actually teaching. Because what the text is teaching is the gospel, that God wants to justify the nations, the Gentiles, those who are far from him by faith. And it is about the gospel all the way back in Genesis chapter 12. The credits have just finished rolling on the movie gospel right up front. Not late, immediately the gospel comes in and everything flows from that. And the primary blessing given to Abraham and to us is the gospel. And we are called to be a channel of this blessing to the nations. Now understand, Abraham was certainly given physical prosperity as well. But why is he given the physical prosperity? To enable him to propagate the gospel to the nations. That's why Abraham has given it, not to hoard it upon himself. It's to enable him to bless others to spread the faith, not to live in luxury. That's not God's call. Believers today are given physical blessings, but these are given so that we might bless others and spread the gospel 
to all nations, not so we can consume it upon ourselves. And those who want to drag that out of the text are saying they're getting something different than the Holy Spirit tells us through Paul is actually in the text. The text is about the gospel going forth. Now, to show that this is not just Paul reading something unusual, nor is it me trying to get it, I'm going to review for a couple of minutes here God's heart to reach and bless the nations. Genesis 12 is the fountain. You know, if you go all the way up into Minnesota, I think it is, you can find a little spot that there is a well springing up, and it becomes the Mississippi River. Now, I'm from the south, and when you get down to Louisiana and you look at the Mississippi, it's really hard to imagine that at some spot there's a place where you could step across the Mississippi. But there is, okay, because it starts out of a fountainhead. Abraham and the call and covenant to Abraham is that first spot. And you can step right across it there, and you can miss it. I want to show you how that river spreads and how that river grows from Genesis 12 all the way to the end of Scripture. First, we think, of course, with Abraham, and we want to read it and say, well, he's promised a nation, and that nation is the nation of Israel. But I want you to see Israel had the same call. The reason God localized it and gave it to them was so that Israel would be a priest to the nations. How do we know this? Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. And I remind you of what's happened. Israel did nothing. God delivered them from Egypt. He brought them out with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and he is graciously giving them his covenant. So once again, it is gospel first. It is grace first. And out of that is to flow Israel's obedience. And here's what he tells him in Exodus 19, 5, and 6. This is at the mountain as Moses is about to get the covenant, the tablets of the covenant. And God says this, If you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Uh, although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and holy nation. Now notice, this is Israel who has already been delivered. Israel, who has already come through the Passover, covered by the blood of the Lamb. Israel, who has already, in fact, been through the Red Sea, which Paul tells us likens our baptism, our water baptism. That's who these words are spoken to, not Israel the unconverted. Israel, who's already been brought into relationship with God. And God says, I want you to obey me, and here's why. As you obey me, you are my treasured possession. Out of the whole earth, you are mine, and you are a priestly nation to the nations. Notice what he's saying there. The whole is mine, but you will be for me a kingdom of priests. It's not just Aaron and all of his sons and all the tribe of Levi. They're just a picture for you of what you're supposed to do to all the nations around you, Israel. As they are priests to you, you are to be priests to the entire world. Israel was called to represent God to the nations and then to intercede for the nations before God, which is what priests do. They speak God's word to us, and then they intercede for us before God. And we once again don't have to wonder how to interpret this text. We're told in the New Testament. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2.9, he says this, but you, speaking to Gentiles, by the way, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. That phrase there that I've got highlighted in yellow is almost verbatim in the Greek to the Greek translation of, of Exodus 19 that we have in the Septuagint. He's just taking the same phrases that were spoken to Israel, and some of them are very rare. So we know what Peter is alluding to, and he's saying, hey, that's who you are. God's call for Israel was to be a nation of priests, and you're called to be the same thing. You're a kingdom. You are a priesthood, a, a holy nation to God. And here's why. Why are you given this call? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into a, his wonderful light. Why has God made us a nation of priests? so that I can consume it on myself, right? So we can gather, because we like getting together and singing and reading an old book together, right? Why has God given us this call? So we can declare his praises and say, I was in the dark. He brought me into the light. I was dead. He made me alive. That is what God has done for me, and I declare those praises to everyone around me. And 
Peter then moves on. If you read in Peter's letter, of course, he gets to the place and he says, once you were not a people, now you're the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. So dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers, you're in a time of exile. You are exiled into this world. But I'm telling you, your call is to live as God's people in the midst of this, declaring his praises, being a priest to the nations, so that no matter where your exile may happen, you are God's channel in that place. Babylon, Israel, America, it makes no difference. Aliens and exiles, but living as the people of the king. And so we are called as priests to declare God's praise and intercede for the nations. This was the call of Israel from the time that God made covenant with them. Again, right at the beginning. If you move forward, however, you can think Israel begins to see their need for a king, and they get the king, but the kings fail them. And so the heart cry comes out for the true king, the Messiah, to come. And in the book of Psalms, Psalm 1 and 2 are the introduction to the psalm. And in Psalm 2, we have a, our first messianic psalm where it's speaking about the Messiah and he's going to come. And in the middle of it, God gives us a great promise to his Messiah King. And notice what the promise is in Psalm chapter 2, verse 8. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. Before Jesus has even come, what is God the Father telling him he can ask for? You want the nations? The previous verse is one of the most oft-quoted reference to Jesus is, today I have begotten you, today I become your Father. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. Every place on this planet is for you. The prophets spoke the same thing, Isaiah who tells us the most about the coming of Messiah. In Isaiah 49, 6, this is one of his servant songs, he says this, the, the father is saying, it is too small a thing for you, the coming servant, the Messiah, to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. God here in these two passages is promising the Davidic king, the Messiah, all of the nations. He is the Messiah, not just for the Jews. He is the Messiah of the Gentiles. And I won't take time. We could go through and read. Greg read part of a psalm earlier. Many of those psalms speak to the nations. Uh, when I was a young guy, first came into the faith, we used to sing Psalm 47. Clap your hands, all ye Nations of people shout to God with the voice of triumph right there in Psalm. And the funny thing is, I never thought about that when I sang that psalm. That this was God all the way back, a long time before Jesus came and saying, I'm calling out to the nations. I want the nations to come. The nations are going to praise me. All the leaders and rulers of the nations are to be the servants of God. That is why Messiah will come. The prophets also recognize and tell us that the nations are going to flood to Yahweh. Micah chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. This one's interesting because this is one of the rare prophecies that's repeated twice, almost verbatim, once by Micah, and then God gives the same prophecy to Isaiah. So you can read these same words in Isaiah chapter 2, but Micah says this. This is about 750 to 800 years before Jesus. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and people's will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. And the law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And so God says, look, the time is going to come that I am going to exalt my temple. If you think of it as a mountain, it's going to be Mount Everest. It's going to be bigger than any other mountain. If you think of it as a temple, it is going to be the most glorious temple. And all the people are going to come, and it will not just be the people of Israel, but in fact, people from every nation are going to come. And the picture is a rising flood rolling towards this temple. And friends, if you read this and think, oh, this is a prophecy about the millennium in the future, you don't know how to read the Bible. What's this about? When did this happen? 
I mean, here, has, th- has this gone on yet? Yes. This is not about some physical building. What is the temple of God? Us. We are the temple of God. Are the nations streaming to the temple of God? Yes. Is there a time today that there will not be Christians gathered praising and worshiping God? No. From the rising of the sun to the time it sets. And you have to understand, when Micah said this, Israel was unfaithful. The northern tribes were about to be carried off into exile. Judah is unfaithful to God, and the prophet stands up and says, as bad as it looks right now, here's what I want to tell you is going to happen. I know it looks like we're just a little inconsequential people losing our place every single day, but I want you to understand that one day the people of God will be spread everywhere, and all of the nations will be coming into it. The Word of God is going to be out everywhere. People will be worshiping Yahweh. Now, if you and I had been sitting there, I would have probably said, Micah, you, you've hit the grape juice too strong. Buddy, we're, we're in trouble. We're, we're, we, don't you see all the things that are happening? Haven't you heard the laws that are being passed in the Capitol? And Micah said, that's got nothing to do with it. I am telling what the Spirit of Yahweh says. The Spirit of Yahweh says the nations will come. No one can pass a law. No one can do anything to change it. And friends, I want to let you know this has happened. It has been happening for 2,000 years. The nations have been streaming in. And we, in in our little sight right now, we look and we feel like, oh, the church is struggling. The church is growing faster than the church has ever grown. It may not be happening on your block. Lift up your eyes. The gospel is spreading. Millions are coming into the kingdom right now. The largest church in the world is in China. There wasn't a church there a few hundred years ago. The second largest mission-sending country in the world is South Korea. And if you check per capita, they they are even higher than that. They're number one because South Korea is not the most populous country in the world. But they are sending out missionaries like mad right now. They are growing. The church is growing the world over. And we, meanwhile, are wringing our hands. It makes no sense. The gospel will prosper because it is God's heart. And it has always been God's heart to reach the nations. The nations will come. Not because I've got a new plan we're going to unfurl. Not because there's a new book coming out, but because the gospel is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. Because the same Holy Spirit that raised our Lord Jesus from the dead is powerful to draw lost men and women to the gospel. And he is doing it right now. There are little brown men and women all over the world that are coming into the kingdom. And they are praying and they are fervent and the gospel is going forth. And we get myopic vision and think that what's happening in America must decide what's happening everywhere. Friends, that is not the case. It is not the case. The gospel will prosper. The New Testament shows this full flowering as the Gentiles come in and the church is sent forth on mission. Jesus himself comes. In John chapter 10, we talked about this earlier this year when Jesus is doing his I am the good shepherd saying, he says this, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there will be one flock and there will be one shepherd. Jesus says, look, I know Israel has so messed this up. They have lost their sight of being the priest to the nations. But I, the Messiah, have come and I've not lost my sight. And there are other sheep that are going to come in. And there's not going to be multiple. We're not going to keep Jews and Gentiles separate. No, there will be one flock. And there will be one shepherd because I am the shepherd over Jew and Gentile, over the people of God. When we look, uh, Jesus tells us, he summarizes the entire Old Testament in Luke chapter 24. He does this twice in the chapter so we can't miss it. I'll just read the last one, verses 45 to 47. Jesus, the resurrected one, is standing there. The disciples still don't get it because they are slow like we are slow. And he speaks to them, and we read starting in verse 45, he opened their minds 
so they could understand the Scriptures. And he told them, this is what is written. Now, where is it written? The Scriptures. This is the Old Testament. That's the only Scriptures we have, okay? We don't have New Testament yet. So Jesus says, this is what the Old Testament says. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Jesus is telling them, this is what it always was. This isn't plan B. This isn't a new idea I've come up with. This is what the Scriptures always said was going to happen. And you, my chosen ones, are going to take it from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. Now, the funny thing is I could turn over to Acts chapter 1 where Jesus tells them, wait in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit's going to come in power. And what's the first question the apostles have got? When are you going to make Israel the big dog on the block again? At which point, I am sure Jesus froze time, banged his head to a pulp, and said, three and a half years, I've been raised from the dead, I have spent 40 days explaining this, and you still don't get it. You still think it's about waiting for them to come to you. You're going to go to them. But when the Holy Spirit gets on you, you're going to figure this out. And that's what he tells them. And the Spirit comes, and suddenly the church is on mission, which is the entire book of Acts. If we move forward, I don't even have time to go through all the epistles. I'll just come down to the book of Revelation. We started this trek in Genesis chapter 12. When we get to the closing scenes of God's drama, his story, what is it that we found? It's a resounding vision of the nations gathering to God. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, we read, They sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. He's piling up the ways of looking at it. He's saying, I want you to understand, it was for everyone that the Lamb came. He did not just come for the people of Israel. He has come, and there are going to be people from every tribe and language and nation and tongue. That's who Jesus purchased. In Revelation chapter 12, I mean 7, we see the fulfillment of this as John is given a glimpse into the heavenly worship. And he says, after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. And they were wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Friends, it is going to happen. It is written. It is guaranteed. Every tribe, every language, every nation, every people group is the term that we're going to keep using and unpacking here. Whoever they are, they will be there. They will be washed and dressed in white. They will be worshiping God because they have been bought by the blood of the Lamb. The Spirit of God is on mission to gather them, and the church will fulfill her mission and take the gospel to them. Amen? You need to understand, do not be downcast. I I get so much stuff where Christians are wringing our hands, oh, the millennials are here, what are we going to do? We're going to see the millennials come to God is what we're going to do. And we worry about what's happening in the world today. The gospel will prosper. It's not up to me. It's not up to you. It is the work of God. And this is not a new thing. He's not like a club a proponent that's living in New York City and suddenly realized there's poor people in the world. God has been on mission from the beginning of time. Nothing will change his heart. Nothing will stop him. It is an unstoppable force. And you and I are simply called into it with him. It's not our mission. It's his mission. And he is gracious enough to let us participate. He could have channeled the blessing through anyone. And why he chose you is beyond me. But he did it. He has picked us. What a privilege. And if you're looking for something to give your life to, how about the eternal purpose of God? There's something worthwhile. All this other stuff will fade, and we will look back at it and say, what in the world was that about? But you will never do that with the mission of God. And that is the whole call in Scripture. 
God's heart for the nations. In the law, it's God's call to Abraham and Israel. In the writings, it's God's promise to Messiah and the longing of God's people. In the prophets, it's the vision of how Messiah will bring the nations to the worship of Yahweh. In the gospels, Jesus sends the church on worldwide mission. In Acts, we read the mission unfolding and see the Gentiles gathered in. In the epistles, we see letters to the burgeoning worldwide church composed of Jews and Gentiles from around the world. And in Revelation, we see the vision of the full church comprised in Jews and Gentiles from every nation, language, and time joining in united worship to the God who has loved and saved them from the dawn of time. Bible, right there. That's what it's about from beginning to end. And friends, for a Christian to take that and turn it in on myself, How do we even do that? It's the heart of God throughout Scripture. So let's apply the word. What does this mean for us? Well, the mission for you and me throughout this series is always applying the word, bringing this home to ourselves. So two questions for us in doing this. Number one, do we see God's heart for the nations in all Scripture? Not, not starting at Matthew 28, all Scripture, do we see God's heart for the nations? I encourage you, read with open eyes. This is not found in just a few passages. I could have taken time and gone through and showed you in the Old Testament where God says Assyria and Egypt are going to be my people, right hand and left, while Assyria and Egypt were threatening Israel and Judah. And God says, lift up your eyes. The ones threatening you, I'm going to call in. I could show you where, when they're carried off into Babylon, the very king who carries them away, Nebuchadnezzar, ends up sending out a decree and saying, everybody needs to worship this God because he's the true God. I can show you where God prospers Daniel. All over Scripture is God's heart for the nations. The heart of God for us is to bless the nations with the gospel, and that is a driving concern from Genesis to Revelation. So the the cognitive question, the question for our minds, do you see God's on mission? God is on mission, has always been on mission. When Israel missed it, it didn't mean God was not on mission. He was on mission. When the church has become internally focused and started gazing at our navels. God's not lacking mission. That's just us being disobedient. So do we see God is on mission? Now that leads to the second question. This one's a little bit more uncomfortable. Does my heart burn to be on mission with God? Not just do I understand it, is it a passion me. Remember, the the very first thing, the heartbeat of mission is worship. What drives us, what fuels us in the mission is there are billions right now, and there are hundreds of thousands just in this county that do not acknowledge the name of Jesus Christ. He's not receiving the praise and honor he is due. That should burn in my heart. And there are billions in this world who suffer, who lack basic physical necessities as the image of God. And there are almost 2 billion who have no access to the gospel. And God has called us to be on mission. Does that vision capture my heart? Here's a quote by John Stott. And it's from an article that is just a wonderful article called Our Missionary God. Our God or the living God is a missionary God. John Stott says this, Now we are Abraham's seed by faith, and the earth's families will be blessed. You recognize the text he's alluding to, Genesis 12. Only if we go to them with the gospel. That is God's plain purpose. I pray that these words... All the families of the earth may be written on our hearts. It is this expression, more than any other, which reveals the living God of the Bible to be a missionary God. We need to become global Christians 
with a global vision, for we have a global God. I, in this series, am not calling us to be global Christians with a global vision against who God is. The problem is we are the ones who restrict it. Our God has always been a global God. He has always had a global vision. He has always been looking out for the nations. People who don't look and talk like us, whose culture is different. And friends, that starts right here. There are people in this area that don't look and talk like us, that have a different culture than us. And our job is not to convert them to our culture, I might point out. Okay, that's not the job. Our job is to get the gospel to them. Because what I really want to point out to you is if you notice in Revelation a few minutes ago, when we get to heaven, do we all speak the same language apparently? Do we all look the same? Do we probably wear the same clothes and have the same culture? Apparently, God likes that we're different, which is good news. We don't have the mission of making people like us. God has enough problems with Brett without Brett trying to replicate myself, okay? That's not my mission. My mission is get the gospel to them and let them in their own culture and in their own expression worship God. And God, our God is so great, there's no one cultural expression could possibly fully express that. Let every culture express that. Let every language express that. Let every skin color, every group on the earth express the greatness of our God. We have a global God, and so we are called to global mission and global vision. But here's the question. Does that describe my heart? Or is my heart much more concerned with my own little things? What am I like? Am I a global Christian? on mission with God. Now, I'm going to give a couple of questions for you to think through before we come to the Lord's table to help us answer that question. Here's a good way to gauge if I am a global Christian on mission with God. Are most of my prayers for me and my family or for God's work here and around the globe? If tomorrow... We were listening to one another in our prayers, and when we started, we clicked the stopwatch and said, okay, how much is me and mine, and how much is God's work out there, God's blessing to the nations from here to the ends of the earth? How much of my prayers are consumed with me and mine, and how much are consumed with God's work here and around the globe? So don't hear me wrong. There is a place for us to pray. But remember, where did Jesus start the Lord's Prayer? Does it start with, yeah, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And only then do we turn to me and mine. So what does it look like in my prayers? Secondly, how about my time? If I consider my time, is it restricted to my own affairs, or does it include time for God's ongoing mission? Now, I'm, you know, meddling a little bit here, but this is where the rubber meets the road. What, what, what drives my prayer life? What drives my time? I will really meddle now. Do my finances show a passion for God's mission or my own needs and my own comfort? Because this is, it's one thing to say, oh, I'm passionate about it, but if it doesn't work into my prayers, it doesn't work into my time, and it doesn't work into my finances, then guess what? I'm not passionate about it. Because that which really drives me shows up in my words and my prayers. It shows up in where I invest my time, and it shows up in where I invest my money. So which things drive me? Because that tells whether that quote is accurate for me, or whether I have fallen prey, because this is the great America. See, we in America can turn it back on ourselves. We love turning it back on ourselves. And we can read all the families of the earth, and we can read that thing, and we can think, this is my way of getting God to bless me. But Stott's right. No, it's about all the families of the earth. God is saying, I want to put the, the blessing through you. And John Piper, I won't put the quote up, but in some very convicting words, said, look, we're a pipeline of God's blessing, and the pipe doesn't have to be made of gold. Copper's good enough. 
But see, we want to make it gold and encrust it and put some jewels on it and do all that and then dribble some drips of water. God says, I'm not interested in that. I want a flood of the gospel. I want a flood of my mercy to the nation. So how does that work in my own heart? Now, we're going to come down to the table. And I want to remind us again, as this whole thing has been about the gospel and about grace, we're going to come to this table of grace where the gospel is made visible. I remind us, we come here first and foremost out of gospel. The only right you and I have to this table is the grace of God. It's the gospel that has been given to us. And so we come to this table today, and first off, we give thanks to God. You can't be on mission with and for God until you're in relationship with God. Dead people aren't on mission, okay? We've been raised from the dead, and this is all by the grace and mercy of God, I look back, something reminded me this past weekend. I mean, when I was 16, I had no interest in the kingdom of God. I was Abraham, and God tapped me on the shoulder one day and saved my wretched soul out of nowhere and changed who I am and everything that has gone on in my life from that moment forward. And, friend, you've got the same testimony, whoever you are. And so we come to this table, and we start by saying, oh, God, thank you. You have made covenant with me, and it's a covenant of grace. It's nothing I have done. But we also, as we come, we examine, and as we examine and we see, if, if you think of that quote just a minute ago, and it's convicting, then I want to encourage us, we receive grace and forgiveness. Because, friends, I, I'm pretty passionate about mission. But there are times I look and I say, that mission's not front and center. Jesus and his kingdom's not front and center. I've gotten, I gotten sidetracked. But when we do that, it's not about resolve. It's not waiting for next New Year's when I can do a resolution. I come and I receive grace. I come and I receive forgiveness. I come and I receive empowerment. And so come and ask for grace and forgiveness. Also come to receive grace to change us. So we can begin to be on mission because I don't want to just say, well, God, I wasn't on mission. Forgive me. And then I'm going to go right back out of here and not be on mission again. I, I want to join you on mission. I want to be part of what you're doing. Would you empower me by your grace? And I want to encourage us as well. We're, I'm going to read before we start this hymn that kind of, well, actually, I'm going to read it as we go along. I'm going to be reading a hymn from Isaac Watts, and I'll read it at various points as we go through communion. But I want to encourage you to also pray as we conclude communion today. There are almost 2 billion people have no access to the gospel to allow them to this table. 2 billion. Friends, that needs to be on our heart. And so I encourage as we conclude today, we're going to, Cry out to God, pity the nations, O oh, our God. Train them who come in. That's the heart of the call. Because everyone should come and feast at this table. Everyone should come and feast at this table. If you're here, you're not a member of our church, you are welcome to join with us. This is the Lord's table. It's his mission, it's his word, and it's his table. You do need to be a believer, which means you understand the gospel that we've been talking about all morning, that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, through no works that I've done on my own or could ever do, purely by the merits of Christ. And I'm justified the same way Abraham was, by faith. If you believe that, friends, please join with us. This is a table that Jesus has given you access to. If you don't, you should just let it pass because then you don't believe the very gospel that it signifies and enacts before our eyes. Friends, what I receive from the Lord Jesus, I pass on to you. But the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. And the same way after supper, our Lord Jesus took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out so that your sins may be forgiven. Drink from this, all of you, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord Jesus, we give you great thanks that you have brought us into the people of God. Lord, we were Gentiles. We were far from the gracious covenant promises of the Father. But you were broken that we might be brought in. We are grateful for that. And this morning we worship you. We give you thanks. And Lord, we pray that our heart beat the same way your heart beat. In Jesus' name, amen. As you get the elements, I encourage you to contemplate the grace and mercy you've received and whether we beat with a passion to see that gospel passed on to others. How sweet and full of awe is the place with Christ within the doors while everlasting love displays the choicest of her stores. While all our hearts and all our songs join to admire the feast, each of us cry with thankful tongues, Lord, why was I a guest? Lord, this morning we stand at this table, and all we can do is offer you thanks. Lord, we who have sinned and fallen short, we who were cut off from your covenant promises, we who had nothing to commend us in your sight. And while we were still sinners, you loved us. And Christ came, and the depth of his love was shown that he was broken for us. Just as we broke this bread, O God, he was broken, he was pierced, he was crushed for us, and for our transgressions. And it is by his wounds that we have been healed. And so, Lord, this morning, confessing our sin and confessing that the only reason we are here at this table of the covenant is because of your mercy and your grace that we did not and do not deserve, but for which we give you thanks. Lord, truly with thankful tongues, we cry out and say, oh Lord, how am I a guest at this table? Father, our only answer is thanks be to God because of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Take and eat. Lord, why was I made to hear thy voice and enter while there's room? when thousands make a wretched choice and rather starve than come. It was the same love that spread the feast that gently drew us in, else we had still refused to taste and perished in our sin. Lord, as I hold this cup of the covenant, this cup that represents the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood that has cleansed me, that has forgiven me, the blood that has put me in everlasting covenant with you, and the blood that cries out for mercy for the nations. Father, I humbly admit that far too often that has not been my own heart. And far too often I act as if that the reason I am here and I join the feast is because of something inside me. But Lord, it was your love that spread this feast. It was your love that sweetly drew us in. It is your love that sustains us moment by moment. Lord, I ask as we take this cup that you would forgive and you would cleanse when we set our hearts 
on so many other things. Oh God, I ask that the same blood of Christ that has covered and broken the penalty of our sin would cleanse us from its stain and power, that it would mold and reshape our hearts, that it would form our consciences and woo our wills, that that which breaks your heart would break ours, and that which gives joy to your heart would give joy to ours, and that, O oh Jesus, which fueled your prayers for the nations would so fuel ours. Lord, shape our hearts to be like your own. Take and drink. Pity the nations, O oh our God, Constrain the earth to come. Send thy victorious word abroad and bring the strangers home. We long to see thy churches full, that all the chosen race may with one voice and heart and soul sing thy redeeming grace. Father, as we have been at this table, Lord, we ask exactly what Isaac Watts did 250 years ago. Pity the nations, O our God. Father, I pray that those who do not know, who pass by this table, who have no longing for the food that God would give to us, who would trample underfoot the precious body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray you would have pity on them. For, Lord, there was a time when I did the same. Lord, there was a time when on a Sunday morning, the last place I would have been was in church with the people of God. There was a time when the last thing I longed for during the week was to read the very Word of God. There was a time when the last thing on my heart and mind was being obedient to the will of my Creator. And Lord, you had mercy on me. Lord, you had pity on me, a sinner. Oh God, we pray that the same mercy and grace which we have read and sang and tasted this morning, we pray that you would extend that mercy and grace to those who don't know you. God, we pray for our neighbors. We pray for the people in this city right now that walk the streets, that live their lives, and they do not know the grace and mercy of our God. God, pity the lost in this very city. God, we pray for those around this world who are trying to find their way with other gods, with other idols, with forging their own path, and Lord, they are lost. Oh, our God, send your word to them. Father, our hearts cry out for two billion who have no access to your gospel. Lord, we cry out, pity them, oh, our God. Father, send your word abroad. Father, may it go to every language. May it go to every people group on this planet. And, Lord, we pray this in confidence, knowing it's not just our will. This is your will. Oh, God, let your heartbeat be done, oh, God. Father, may your kingdom come. May your will be done on all nations on this earth, just like it is in heaven. Oh, our God, send your word to the nations. And, oh, our God, would you use us as your channel of blessings? Lord, would you renew and call us into the mission with you this very day? Lord, I pray for us that we would find the deepest joy we can know in this life by knowing you and being on mission with you. Let our hearts be aflame with the glory and the gospel of Christ. I ask that you would do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to conclude with a word of benediction. This is out of Psalm 67. I encourage you to receive the blessing of God.
and then go forth and be a blessing. May God be gracious to you and bless you and make his face shine upon you that his ways may be known on earth, his salvation among all nations, so that the peoples may praise our God, so that all the peoples praise him. Go forth blessed and be a blessing. Amen. Thank you for listening to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. For more teachings and resources, please visit www.brcc.church.